Today was a very big day because we got a key economic indicator and the data around that. And I'm talking about the GDP. The real gross domestic product measured by production decreased by 0.1% in the first quarter of 2024. In addition to that, we know that the Reserve Bank has issued projections for GDP this year, and the projection is 1%. To put it in perspective, the growth rate has averaged 0.8% since 2012, and the target has been that the growth, the NDP target, that is, should be 5.6% year-on-year growth. Now, if I'm talking Greek, if, if it's not making any sense, let me break it down. Gross domestic product is a measure of the total value of all goods and services produced within the country's borders in a specific time period, usually annually or quarterly. It's a comprehensive indicator that is used to gauge the economic health of a country. And many people are interested to know um, what the health of a country is. So, for instance, investors need to know what the wealth, uh, the growth of a country is so that they can make an investment decision. The public needs to know what the health of the economy is, and this helps them know. And then also policymakers need to know where a GDP is performing so that they can actually make policy interventions. And this is where the leaders that you have or pick or the combinations of coalitions that you have or end up having have a bearing on the economy. But let's dive deeper. And this data is all from Statistics South Africa. They released this data today. And um, it's concerning data. I don't want to put it in any other way. It's very concerning data considering the challenges that are in the South African economy. So here are the industries that recorded negative growth between the fourth quarter of 2023 and the first quarter of 2024. Here we go. The manufacturing industry decreased by 1.4%. Right? And under that manufacturing sector, Five of the, sorry, industry, five of the 10 manufacturing divisions reported negative growth rates in the first quarter. And here they are. The motor vehicles, parts and accessories and other transport equipment division, the basic iron and steel division, the non-ferrous metal products, metal products and machinery division, electricity, gas and water industry as well went down. So Basically, a lot of the things that South Africa has been making in the secondary industry have actually not had a strong three months. And that's something that overall we should be worried about because manufacturing has shown weakness, actually. It was a little bit strong in 2017, 18, and 19, but it hasn't really come back up after the pandemic to those figures. It's really been lower than what it's been. And when you stretch the picture out much further than just 2017 up until now, which would be the last seven, eight years, you then can actually see that manufacturing has consistently been weak and you cannot grow the economy without fixing the issues in manufacturing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in this particular discussion. The mining industry decreased by 2.3%, right? So mining also not looking good. Construction industry decreased by 3.1%. Agriculture industry went up, actually, which was a little bit of a a boost to the numbers. But if you then think about everywhere else where there was weakness, South Africa relies on mining. You do need to have construction. If those two are not performing well, that's going to indicate on your economic indicators as well. Then when it comes to gross fixed capital formation, that decreased by 1.8%. Now, if you're wondering what the hell is gross fixed capital formation, I wish economists use different language. I really do, because sometimes, you know, you're just like, why is it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Side chat. Let me explain what that is to you, right? Gross fixed capital formation looks at how many fixed assets did we actually add to the collective of fixed assets and fixed assets are tangible or intangible assets that are used repeatedly and continuously for more than one year in production processes. Some examples include accommodation, houses, factories, other residences, non-dwelling construction, industrial, commercial, and non-dwelling residential buildings, water and sewage installation, machinery and equipment, vehicles, aircrafts, ship, 
ships, electoral, electrical apparatus, land improvements such as fen- fences, ditches, drains, construction of roads, railways, schools, offices, and hospital. All of this falls under gross fixed capital formation. And what we saw under the gross fixed capital formation is that it also went down, right? So when you think about all of these issues, you should really be now getting concerned about the health of the economy because a lot of the key numbers I'm giving you are not positive. Mining is down. Manufacturing is down. Then there's another big gross fixed capital formation is down. There's another big sector that you need to be worried about as well. Household final consumption expenditure. Household final consumption expenditure also decreased by 0.3% in the first quarter. And the decreases were in areas such as durable goods, semi-durable goods, and services. So basically, most of the things that are not related to food and electricity and fuel showed that there's a decrease. Now, actually contributed to a decrease is what I'm saying. This just shows you that homes are not really renewing assets. They're not renewing um, things like fridges and things like that because they're struggling with the cost of living. So when you get a GDP um, set of data like this, you really then begin to be aware that the the economic indicators are not positive. So the GDP data is one set of data, but there's another set of data that we got earlier in May this year, which also is a cause for concern. And I'm talking here about the unemployment data in particular. We know that there are 16.7 million South Africans who are employed, but we also know that 12.1 million South Africans are unemployed and 13.1 million South Africans are not economically active. So 16.7 million South Africans employed, and then we've got a group of 25.2 million South Africans who are either unemployed or just not economically active. And out of a labor force of 40, what's the labor force? 40, 42, 41, 41 million people. That's a significant number of people who are unemployed. Then you dive in to the numbers in more detail, right? In terms of who is unemployed and who is facing that unemployed, unemployment, right? When it comes to young people between the ages of 15 to 24, unemployment is at 70% on the expanded definition. The expanded definition is the more accurate definition, in my opinion, because it measures not only those who are still seeking jobs actively, but those who are also discouraged. So 70% for 15 to 24. Then when it comes to 25 to 35, the number of people who are unemployed in that group is 49%. That's a very high number on the expanded definition. So basically one out of two people between the ages of 25 to 35 and also three or two out of three people between the ages of 15 and 24 are unemployed, right? Just over two out of three or seven out of 10, if you want simplicity. But uh, that's that's the situation. And it's not a great situation. Then you begin to look at other indicators in that unemployment data, one of which is that graduate unemployment has started to go up. So people who've been going to university, going to TVETs, graduated, completed their courses, are now beginning to see an uptick in unemployment, and it's gone up by 2.3%. percent hmm? 2.3%. So it's a 12 now. It used to be well below 10%. So that shows you that not only is unemployment now affecting, you know, um, not only is unemployment affecting those who are typically, you know, considered to have no education, you know, less than matric or just matric. It is now affecting everybody and it is continuing to affect people. And that's why you often hear people talking about the fact that they know relatives, they know people who are currently unemployed and who are graduates. They'll say things like graduates are sitting at home. And it is a reality that graduates are sitting at home because 12% of graduates right now are sitting at home without employment. And that I think also is an indictment on on the, the state of national affairs because a lot of money is spent on getting those students to get to a point where they can get grades good enough to get into university, to get into technicons. And a lot more money is spent to make sure that those people can complete those programs. And if all of that money has been spent and invested in that human capital, if that human capital is not productive and is not gainfully employed and not economically active, 
that therefore means that all of the state's investment in that individual have actually been for naught. And that's something that we all have to think about. So I know everyone is, is talking about coalitions. I know everyone is discussing that stuff and it's of interest. And of course, it has a relevance here as well because who become the leaders in the executive, the individuals, the parties will affect this. Sometimes when you're in a period where you've had very low growth for a very low period of time, or even you're at risk of getting into recession, then interventions are necessary. Some people have the viewpoint that in those instances, you stimulate the economy. That means you, you, you create opportunities within the economy and you actually try to find ways to increase money supply to places where you think things are weak. That is stimulus. The other side of the equation looks at, it, uh, looks at austerity as a measure. They want to cut down. They want to streamline. They want to make things more effective, cut down debt. But as they do that, obviously, people are losing their jobs. People are not able to, you know, spend as much because of the austerity intervention. Austerity typically does not lead to increased growth, but it's something that is favored by people who are in the, the markets because it's a conservative approach and it has a lower risk for them. Whereas if you stimulate the economy through various measures, what that can do is become inflationary and devalue the cash assets that those people are sitting on. So you'll find that markets generally do not really like stimulus and are hesitant to endorse that kind of a stimulus strategy. So as coalitions are being discussed, one of the things that you have to be thinking and asking yourself is, what is this particular group of politicians going to do in respect to the issue of the economy, in respect to the issue of unemployment? Because as you continue to see this weakness uh, in the economy, this stagnation in the economy, you're not going to be able to create jobs. You're not going to be able to deal with a lot of the issues that are currently plaguing South Africa. So where, where are the fixes? You know, where are the solutions? So one of the places where I like to look for indicators outside of just the South African documents is the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report, right? The World Economic Global Competitiveness Report gives you measures of how a country is performing. So South Africa, in the last one where they were just ranking countries, comparing them directly to each other, was at 60. But it was very strong on finance. Finance was at number 19 but it was very weak in, in a variety of areas. It was very weak on crime. Crime was ranked at 118 out of 141. So crime is definitely a red flashing indicator light on that dashboard, right? Number two, it was ranked very lowly on quality of skills in the workforce and quality of education and training of the workforce. So when it comes to uh, skills of the workforce, the ranking was 101 out of 141. So without going much further, you can see that if we fix the issue of crime and if we fix the issue of skills training for workers, you already go up and then you're able to address the manufacturing crisis, right? So there's a need for, for fixing skills, there's a need for fixing crime. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do if you don't fix the crime or try to directly address the crime. Whatever factory you build, whatever, can still get stuff stolen from it. So, and then that defeats the purpose and that's unattractive to investors, right? The other area, which was a low ranking area, was the issue of health, right? The public healthcare system is funded to the tune of $271 billion, But oftentimes that money doesn't get where it's supposed to go because money can be looted. If you remember the, what was it? It was the Tembisa Hospital saga where one billion was looted due to fraudulent activities with the invoices. So it can be a really serious thing. Um, just in terms of like looting and the impact on the, the service delivery in and of itself. The other area where there was a, a discrepancy, which is worth thinking about in terms of how do you fix um, the economy, quick fixes, low hanging fruits. The South African financial sector was ranked in the top 20. But when it came to funding for small to medium businesses, the financial sector was actually ranked very low at 77 compared to their overall ranking. And then when it came to the financing of small ventures or venture capital rather, which is important to create these kind of startups that you've been seeing in the world 
also the funding was very low. And I think that was at 90 something. So if you look at that discrepancy in ranking, overall financial sector, ranking for small to medium enterprises as funding, ranking for venture capital funding, you can see why you're not seeing a lot of these creative disruptive companies in South Africa because there's no funding. And then you're not seeing a lot of small businesses creating the kind of jobs that everybody talks about because there's no funding. So it's going to be very important going forward that policymakers as well as financiers sit down and try to think about how do we close the gaps for those who are from places like townships or communities where they don't have collateral? How do we fund those ventures? How do we fund small businesses? Because if you don't fund small businesses, you don't have uh, you know, job creation. You don't also have growth of an economy. The key model of finance, and sorry, not finance, but capitalism, is that I have an idea and I have the capacity to execute that idea, but I need funding to do it. The bank gives me funding. I create this particular product, give them back their money, and they then can relearn that money because I paid interest. But at the same time, I've created value in the economy and that creates growth. Unfortunately, the South African banks have taken a very conservative approach to risk and they've actually not been funding small businesses. So if you don't fund a lot of small businesses, you don't lose any of the money, right? But you also don't grow any of the economy from that approach. Very conservative and uh, something has to happen in that respect. We can't look at that discrepancy and think that it's okay. It's not okay. All of the other OCD, uh, OECD uh, countries have actually done much better than South Africa at opening up venture funding and making sure that small businesses are funded. South Africa is far behind, right? So this is something that has to be addressed. It's not only the politicians who are responsible for the underperformance. Sometimes it can be the private sector holding on to assets and finances as opposed to participating in the game. And by the way, uh, having four, six, eight banks in an economy the size of 60 million people is also an indication of market failure because that's an oligopoly system. If you go and read economic books about the history of capitalism, you'll find many of the fastest growing economies had sometimes 400 banks, uh, you know, offering financing and also, you know, offering financial services. The fact that there are only four big ones shows that actually something has gone wrong in the South African economy. That's what market failure means. Um, and something needs to be addressed. But Obviously, he who leads affects these kind of conversations. But I just thought it would be important for us to also look at that key element. You know, sometimes people just look at politics without looking at economics, right? And sometimes these things are separated from each other to prevent everyone from having a collective understanding of what needs to be done. Realistically, everybody needs to understand politics, philosophy, economics, and sociology. Those, for me, are four important baseline subjects that everyone has to understand, even if they're going to be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, or whatever the case may be, because we all need to understand how society works, how the economy works. We all need to develop a philosophical framework to guide our ethics and and um, help us make quality decisions in all of the spaces that we're going to be in. We also all need to have an understanding of politics because the politicians make the laws that govern the society that we all live in, and their systems of lawmaking, law enforcement, of creating, you know, rule of law in a society that everyone needs to be aware of. So if you're not aware of the politics, you're not aware of the ideologies, the frameworks and all of that, you're not even going to have a, a grasp when the laws are actually formulated and not know how to hold people to account. Unfortunately, we don't always have that in the South African uh, space and also just globally, people are always often put into these silos where they don't see the whole picture. But we need multidisciplinary thinking at a critical time like this because one of the things I didn't mention is that inequality in South Africa remains at an all-time high. So the GDP doesn't actually give you an indication sometimes of inequality, but inequality is another measure. And South Africa is number one in the world at inequality. It is the most unequal country in the world. And that also has to be addressed in order to create these kind of opportunities that we think we all deserve. In any case, that's the information from today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it provoked your thinking. Uh, comment, like, subscribe. We'll chat in the next one. Peace.